Once again, we thank you for your tremendous love in the gospel. It is truly amazing. We praise you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter one. If you weren't with us last week, uh, we shared from Colossians chapter one. We did an intro to Colossians and two weeks ago, we let you know that Smed is on sabbatical for the summer. Smedley and his family are enjoying some much needed rest and um, and we're grateful for him. So we're going to be taking a break from the book of Romans and spending some time in Colossians together, making our way through that. As we begin, as you're turning to Colossians 1, we all feel gratitude for various things in our lives. Things come in and into our lives that we're, we're grateful, we're thankful for, and we have varying degrees of gratitude for those things. Um, we have a neighbor, uh, my family and I, who has some, we've somehow, he's become endeared to our children, and he brings us food, groceries, and leaves them at our door, and rings the doorbell, and walks away. And uh, he speaks broken English. I tried to track him down just to get an idea, because he keeps just leaving food at our doorsteps, and our children aren't, like, painfully skinny, and so <laughs> I, don't, I don't totally understand why he's doing it, but he keeps doing this. He keeps leaving food at our doorstep. And I, I tracked him down. I'm like, thank you so much for the food, but w- why are you doing this? And he goes, oh, it makes the children happy. It makes the children happy. And I'm like, well, that's, that's super kind. And it's true. Every time he drops off food, there's a, a level of excitement and gratitude and thankfulness, but it varies to some degree. You see, the, the times that he brings cake the amount of thankfulness is one degree in comparison with the times that he drops off soy milk for the children. I feel bad for his children growing up, but there's varying degrees of gratefulness for what he brings. This morning, we're going to see Paul express a cake-like level of gratefulness for something. Paul is demonstrating gratitude through prayer, and this isn't just a, a passing gesture of gratitude. This isn't, oh, well, that's kind of a nice surprise. This is, this is heartfelt. Paul is really overwhelmed with gratitude, with thankfulness for what he is seeing taking place. It's a deep, heartfelt expression of thankfulness to God. At times, it's easy to breeze past sections like this. We're going to look at today and miss the deep, heartfelt engagement in what is being said. Now, by way of reminder, Paul is in prison, and he's in prison for the sake of the gospel. He's experienced persecution. He's been beaten, rejected by his own people. He, He says in Philippians, he's suffered the loss of all things and yet counts them but rubbish in comparison to knowing God. This isn't a man who is driven by his earthly circumstances, but he is looking beyond those for something intentional and purposeful, which is the glory of God and the gospel going forth. This is the passion of his heart. He says in Colossians 1.24 that he rejoices in his suffering for the sake of the Colossians. And then in verse 28 of chapter 1, he says that the purpose for his teaching and admonishing men is to present every man complete in Christ. Paul desires to see people grow in their faith in the Lord, to be mature in the Lord. This is why he's laboring. He desires to see individuals grounded in Christ. This is his aim, and this is what he is suffering for. And Paul is in prison as Epaphras, a native of Colossae, comes to Paul and reports to him how the believers in Colossae are doing. And it's a good report. It's a good report. And can you just imagine for a moment what this kind of news would have done to Paul's heart as he's sitting in prison to hear this report of what's going on in these people's lives? Paul had not been to Colossae. They were taught by Epaphras, who most likely was converted sometime during Paul's three years teaching in Ephesus during his third missionary journey. Yet the gospel is spreading, and Paul hears this report, and when he says in Colossians 1, 3, we give thanks to God, 
he is thanking God for that which is most impressed on his heart, that which matters most, that the gospel would continue to go forth, that souls would be saved, that churches would be established and that believers would be matured. So Paul shares this wonderful prayer for the Colossians with the Colossians, which no doubt was a tremendous encouragement to them to hear the ways that Paul is thankful for God's work in them. And then he prays things specifically for them. This morning, we're going to see in verses three through eight, what Paul is thankful for. And then next week, we're going to look at the following verses, verses nine through 14, and we'll see his petitions for the Colossians. So this morning, let's look together at chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Chapter 1, starting in verse 3, Paul says this. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf and he also informed us of your love in the spirit. Well, here, if we were to break down Paul's prayer, which we're going to do this morning a little bit, what we see is that Paul highlights five manifestations of the gospel in the Colossians' lives for which he gives thanks to God. Paul highlights five manifestations, five outflows, five evidences of the gospel's work in the lives of the Colossians for which he gives thanks to God. Paul is going to set forth five ways that the gospel is being manifested. It's it's taking root. It's showing itself. It's having its intended purpose in the lives of the Colossians. And he gives thanks to God for these things. Look again at verse three. Paul says, we give thanks to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. This thankfulness is not a moment of sentiment. This is a continual ongoing gratitude. The word order in the NASB makes it a little confusing, but it is more likely the word always is modifying the give thanks, not the praying. It would be better understood. We give thanks every time we pray for you. It seems Paul cannot intercede on behalf of the Colossian church without heartfelt gratitude to God. When he thinks of the Colossians, he thinks thankfully of what God is doing in their lives. And Paul says, we give thanks, considering he referenced the fact Timothy, our brother, is with him. In verse 2, it seems they both heard this report and are rejoicing in this report that they have been given, giving thanks to God for God's work in the believers in Colossae. You see, Paul is extremely interested in the spiritual well-being of the believers he hasn't even met yet. He hasn't even met them. He, he, his love for God, his desire to see God's people come to know the Lord is being put on display here. He is, watching, he is watching obedience to the Great Commission produce fruit as the gospel is spreading to places he hasn't gone and it is filling his heart with thanks. How exciting this is. Paul was deeply interested in the spiritual realities of others. And in verse four, Paul goes into those things for which he gives thanks to God for in prayer. So the first manifestation of the gospel that Paul highlights in his prayer for the Colossians is this. He highlights their faith in Jesus. Their faith in Jesus. This is the first manifestation of the gospel in the lives of the Colossians for which Paul gives thanks. He gives thanks since they heard of their faith. Look at verse four. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and this is really the most exciting, exhilarating report that he could receive, that he could hear. They have faith in Christ Jesus. And ever since the moment that he heard of their faith, he is giving thanks to God. Paul had never met these believers personally. He hasn't visited them, but the report has come to him of their trusting confidence in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
And it's clear that the Colossians have recognized Jesus as the Messiah. He references that reality by saying Christ Jesus. The Colossians believed Jesus was the one to come. He is the one who had come. He is God in the flesh, who made atonement for sin, who satisfied God's wrath who is the only source of salvation and reconciliation to God. And they have faith in this. They have a life-altering confidence within the core of their heart that Jesus is the way of salvation. And to have faith in Christ is to trust in the work of Jesus as wholly sufficient to entrust yourself wholly to him in that work. And the Colossians have done this. This is truly worth rejoicing in. This is news that has the greatest bearing on one's eternity. If a close friend got a huge promotion and a a raise that tripled their salary, that would be life-impacting news. You would rejoice, hopefully, for that family, be excited with them over that. This news, that they have faith in Christ Jesus, is not simply a piece of news that steps into all the other news of one's life, as if it's a piece of good news. This news about them, that they have faith in Christ Jesus, alters their eternity. Everything in their lives is impacted by this news. This is the best news we could hear of any person. There is nothing else we could hear about someone that would be greater more encouraging than the fact that someone has faith in Jesus Christ, genuine saving faith in Jesus Christ. It's a whole different category. There's nothing that alters the life more. Dead being brought to life from condemnation to forgiveness, from separation from God to fellowship with God, from being guilty before God to receiving Christ's righteousness separation from God to being reconciled to God. And this is what faith in Christ brings. It's what it accomplishes in a believer's life. And Paul gives thanks to God for this faith because it originates out of God. They didn't conjure up this faith in themselves. The object of his praise is God himself. Their faith didn't come from them. It came from God. And so he gives thanks for the work that God is doing in their lives. He has a heartfelt thanks to God. Every time we pray, we give thanks since we heard of your faith. That's what Paul says. So first we see the manifestation of the gospel taking place in the Colossians' lives as they have faith in Jesus. Next we see, number two, their love for the saints. Number two, love for the saints. And he says, love for all the saints. Look at the second half of verse four and the love which you have for all the saints. It's the next manifestation of the gospel in their lives. They have placed their faith in Jesus. And true faith in Jesus is accompanied by love for the saints. John says in 1 John 4, 20, you can just listen. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You see, there are results of genuine saving faith in the believer's life. Faith in Jesus produces specific things. The gospel takes root in someone's heart by the gift of God, by the gift of faith from God, but genuine faith in Jesus produces love, particularly love for the saints, for other believers. Remember when we looked at verse Verses one and two last week, and we saw Paul's salutation to the the saints and faithful brethren. We spoke about how that was one category described in two different ways. He's not talking about, man, you just really love the really good Christians, right? To be a Christian is to be a saint, a set apart one for Christ. And so Paul is saying here comprehensively, you have a love for all believers, all those in the Lord, And that's the report that he's receiving. And this is important. Jesus actually commands this for believers that we would love one another. In John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. 
And he says, by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A defining mark of Christians is our love for each other. And the report that Paul is hearing from Epaphras is that this indeed is the case for the Colossians. They have faith in Jesus Christ and that faith in Jesus Christ is accompanied by a love for all the saints and that's how it should be and this is good. It is commendable and it is absolutely an expression of God's work in the gospel in their lives and Paul gives thanks for these things. This outward expression of love for all the saints demonstrates and confirms outwardly the work that God has accomplished inwardly in them. And the love that they have here is an agape love. This is a warm regard for the interest in another. This love is felt in the heart, but it is a decision of the will. You choose to love this way. You don't simply respond to someone as they merit this love. This isn't something where you see a cute picture and emotionally you're like, oh, I love that. No, this is a decision of the will that leads to emotions and actions towards one, towards others. This love is sacrificial, It's looking for the interest of others. And don't miss this. Paul thanks God because they have this for all the saints. All the saints. All believers, this is truly commendable, a truly commendable virtue. They have not demonstrated a discriminate love. They don't love some believers who have their act together, but then don't love others. This is so helpful to observe right here. There is a tem- tremendous temptation to love in a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of way, some and not others. It's just a reality. There is a temptation there for us. It is much easier to love those that think like us, that enjoy things like us, that have certain views like us, that have certain hobbies like we do. maybe intersecting even more personally in our lives, that thinks the same way about response to COVID-19 as us, that thinks about politics like us, that thinks about racial issues and social injustice like us. And, And to maybe not in words straight up say we don't love each other, but in practice to not love those who disagree with us on things like this, to let our hearts grow cold or bitter or discontent, to hold on to offenses, maybe to to not be patient as we should be, to not be kind, to be arrogant, to actually take into account wrongs suffered, to not bear all things, to not believe all things, to not hope all things, to not endure all things. There is a temptation that we cannot succumb to. We have to love. It's evident that this is happening in the Colossians' lives. They have love for one another. And this is crucial because we know that to not love actually hinders the unity within the church. Paul makes that clear in chapter 3, verse 14 of Colossians. There he states, you can look at it just for a moment, turn just to the right. And his direction for the believers in Colossians on how they should live in light of what God has accomplished in the gospel, setting their mind on things above. In verse 14, he says, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. It's the perfect bond of unity. The Colossians have this love and they have it for all the saints. What a sweet commendation and prayer of thanks this is. And we all must be faced with the The question, could this be made of me? Could this report be given of me? That there is a a love, an indiscriminate love for all the saints. Have we allowed things around us to be a barrier to our faithfulness to this call to love one another? Have you put conditions on your love for those in the body? 
Maybe you've been hurt by another, you feel justified by your responses, and you're holding on to those things. You're taking account of wrongs suffered. You'll get close to some in the body, but you're reluctant to engage with others. Listen, we're not obligated to have the same level of friendship with every person in the body of Christ. That's never going to happen. That's not the obligation. To have the same amount of fellowship, friendship, interaction with every person in the body. But we are obligated to love indiscriminately. Which is predominantly a matter of our heart. And if we're withholding love from some, whatever the reason may be, you're actually hindering unity in the body. We need to be sobered by that. We need to be spurred on in our love for one another because of that. Maybe one question to help evaluate where your heart is in this. Do you think more about your disappointment in those around you or your loving service and consideration for others in the church? Which do you think more about? Do you think more about your disappointment in those around you or your loving service and consideration of others in the church. Each of us is called to love. We're called to love. The Colossians were doing this well, and Paul gives thanks for that. And one last thing on this, one of the greatest ways we can actually guard ourselves from sin in the church, one of the, the, the greatest ways we can guard ourselves in the church from sin is by cultivating this love for others. Just think about it. Selfishness, greed, covetousness, anger, bitterness, discontentment can all be set aside by an active obedience to love of others above ourselves. So the first manifestation of the gospel for which Paul gives thanks is their faith in Jesus. Next, he partners right with this, their love for all the saints. And then we see the, the common triad of faith, love, and hope here put forth that Paul loves to put forth in verse five when Paul thanks God because of the Colossians' uh, hope in heaven. They possess a hope in heaven. That's number three. So the third manifestation of the gospel in their lives, their hope in heaven. Look at verse five. He thanks God, right? Thanks God in verse three, since they heard of their faith and love in verse four, because of the hope laid up in heaven. This hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Their faith in Jesus and their love for all the saints is rooted and grounded in a hope that is laid up for them in heaven. Faith and love springs forth from this hope in heaven that the Colossians possess. Now, what is this hope laid up in heaven that Paul is speaking of here? This is a hope for every believer as it is part of the gospel. It is part of the word of truth that the Colossians have heard. It, it is true that as John 17, when Jesus prays, he says, those who know God possess eternal life currently, yet there is a hope laid up or stored up yet to come reserved for believers. There is something we long for that awaits all who believe. Paul actually speaks about hope two other times in this chapter. He references hope in verse 23 and then verse 27. Look at verse 23 of chapter 1. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. And then he references it again in verse 27. We'll read verse 26 and 27 of chapter one. He says, that is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And then here we go, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's clear here, Paul is not simply referring merely to a state of mind of hopefulness. He's looking to something objective, an inheritance to be gained. There's something awaiting believers. This hope is that one day we will be in glory with Christ. We will be conformed fully to Christ's image. We will see Christ and be like him, as John says in 1 John. And this hope has an impact on how the believer navigates this life. 
the hope that is in store for us where we will no longer be under this mixed condition of sin is truly precious for the believer. It has an impact on how the believer navigates this life. There is an endurance in this life that is perpetuated by the hope of what is to come, of what is awaiting us, of what is being stored up for us, waiting for the perfect moment. That's why in chapter three, Paul exhorts the Colossians to set their minds on things above in verse two. And then if you keep reading in chapter three, in verse five, he talks about considering your members as dead to all these various sins, and we do well to dwell on the hope laid up for us in heaven. Why would we trade the glorious hope of what awaits us in eternity for the garbage of sin in the present? A Christian can endure hardship, endure persecution, persevere through trial, press on in tragedy, all all because Christians have a hope in something outside of ourselves and a hope of a world beyond this one. We have a hope in the work of Christ, which has given to us a hope in eternity in heaven. And to remind yourself of the hope laid up or stored away in heaven waiting for you is a tremendous aid for the believer in heart shepherding. This also points to the reality that what should burden a believer's heart is their own holiness before God. Life is hard. Pain is real. Circumstances are tough. But Lord, there is a day coming where I will sin no more. And the effects of sin will influence my life no more. There's a reward for those who follow you. There is a hope of glory. So press on now, trusting you, seeking to endure in faithfulness. This is a wonderful thing that the believer has this hope. This hope is part of the gospel. Reconciliation to God and fellowship with him for all eternity. What a glorious day that will be. Next, number four, Paul gives thanks for their growth in fruit. The first manifestation of the gospel for which Paul gives thanks is their faith in Jesus. And then he gives thanks for their love for all the saints. And we see the triad of faith, love, and hope in verse five, when Paul thanks God because of the Colossians' possession of a hope in heaven. And next, he talks about the hope of heaven, which they heard in the gospel. And in his prayer of thanks, he recognizes the growth in fruit that is taking place in all the world, but specifically it has been bearing fruit in the lives of the Colossians since they heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. Paul thanks God for the gospel's work in the Colossians as there is constant growth in fruit. Look at verse 6 which has come to you, that's referring to the gospel, just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Paul here gets caught up in the gospel and the power of the gospel and the impact that it's having in the lives of the Colossians and and even among the world. And in a statement in all the world, Paul is marveling from prison at the way that the gospel is having an impact on people's lives in an increasing fashion. It is spreading, it is increasing, it is going forth beyond him. Remember, he's writing to a church he hasn't visited yet. Hasn't visited. And and he's grateful by the way the gospel is going forth and changing people's lives. The gospel produces an inward change in individuals that leads to an outward growth of the body. It bears fruit and is increasing like a a fertile grapevine where the vine is growing rapidly. And yet all along the vine, fruit is being produced constantly. That is what the gospel does. It, It transforms lives. It goes forth. It pushes forward. And all the while, while it's doing that, it's bearing fruit along the way in the lives of the individuals that are being affected by it. This growth of fruit is evidence that the gospel has taken root in their lives. There's just no room for being a stagnant Christian. Uh, To think that we could profess faith in Christ, not have love for the saints, not produce fruit, fruit, is to deceive ourselves. 
This is what the gospel does. A true understanding of the grace of God in truth leads to growth in fruit. The gospel isn't grown in your life by your deeds, right? We don't make the gospel take root in our heart by our deeds. But when the gospel has taken root in our heart, it bears fruit. It bears fruit. Paul says this has been happening to the Colossians since the day they heard of the gospel and understood the grace of God and truth. And how encouraging this is. The Colossians heard the gospel. They understood the grace of God and truth. This is just a good reminder. Do you thank God for the fruit of the gospel in the lives of other believers? Is that on your radar to look for, to rejoice in? When you hear reports of faithful brethren elsewhere and the ways that they're living and glorifying God and being faithful in obedience, does it bring joy and gratefulness to your heart as the gospel is going forth? Here we see that the gospel produces fruit both in personal transformation of individuals and in corporate growth of the church. More disciples growing more disciples, we see God's wisdom put on display. The gospel not only saves individuals, but it changes their lives and produces fruit. And then lastly, Paul gives thanks, drawing attention to the way the gospel is manifesting itself in the Colossians' lives as he acknowledges there is a reputable testimony of love. A reputable testimony of love. Paul circles back around here in verse four, he spoke about hearing of the love they have for all the saints. And here he talks about how Epaphras informed them of their love in the spirit. Look at verses seven and eight. Just as you learned it, again, the gospel from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant or slave who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the spirit. This is so sweet really interesting. Look at verse seven, just as you learned it, the it there is the gospel. The Colossians through the instruction of Epaphras had come to learn the gospel. And in verse six, he said, they heard and came to understand it. This indicates that Epaphras had brought to them intentional instruction. He discipled them. Epaphras, who is referenced as one of the Colossians' own number, had invested greatly in them. And Paul commends Epaphras as a fellow bondservant, a beloved fellow bondservant or a slave who is a faithful servant of Christ on their behalf. Epaphras is a mature brother and he's a a faithful servant of Christ. He's not lacking in usefulness. He's not lacking in discernment. He is a wise man a faithful slave of Christ. And Epaphras has informed Paul and his companions of the Colossians' love in the spirit. There is a testimony of love that has come to Paul from a trustworthy or reputable source, a reliable source. Paul sums up the power of the gospel and the presence of the spirit of God in the lives of the Colossians by their life of love. And again, we see the identifying mark of a believer is a biblical Christ-like love. The world does not get this love. They esteem a worldly idea of love, but reject the biblical reality of love and an identifying mark of those who have received salvation through the gospel is love, a divine love, which again later Paul describes in chapter three as we looked at previously, which is the perfect bond of unity for the church. Paul describes this love as in the spirit, meaning the instrument that brought forth this love is the spirit. This love, again, is an outward evidence of the inward work of God. Paul in Galatians 5, describing the fruit of the spirit, first draws attention to love as a product of the spirit's work in the life of the believer. Romans 5, 5 tells us that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And what an encouragement to hear of this love the Spirit was producing in the Colossians. And it came from a reputable source. A trustworthy testimony of love by Epaphras was confirmation of the gospel's work in the lives of the Colossians. And Paul is giving thanks for all of these things. 
What is the testimony of the spiritually mature regarding your life? Thought about that as looking at this passage and studying this. What is the, what is the testimony of the spiritually mature regarding your life? If, if the spiritual, spiritually mature, if the godly, if the spiritual leadership in your life is concerned for your spiritual well-being, and you find yourself ever chafing against that, wrestling against that, and using the affirmation of the spiritually immature or of those who are making a shipwreck of their own lives as a defense for your own actions, stop. I know it seems obvious, but it is a temptation for us far too often It seems so obvious, and yet it is so easy to get caught up in our own echo chamber of our self-assessment. We want to defend ourselves, and we miss the loving admonishment and care and spiritual encouragement and insight of those who love us and want to advocate for our holiness. Or there's a temptation to intentionally position yourself away from the spiritual leaders in our lives because we, we don't like their assessment We should value far more the input of the spiritual leaders in our lives than our own assessment of ourself. What a sweet thing to be able to have leadership, those who are pouring into you spiritually, testify of the reality of your love in the spirit. That's what we should aspire to. That's what we should should seek, to be faithful that God's work in us would be evident to those who are spiritually discerning to see it. Well, what a model of prayer that we have here. A couple thoughts as we've seen that for which Paul gives thanks. Next week, we're gonna see what Paul specifically presents as petitions for the Colossians. What do you find yourself thanking God for? Paul, really the predominant thing that he thanks God for when he's thinking about the Colossians is what God has done through the gospel in their lives. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's desiring. That's what he's drawn to. That's what he's fixated upon. Do you give intentional thought to looking for the things that please God in others and to thanking God for those things? We should be a church that prays. We should be a church that prays for one another. We should be a church that has eyes to see what God is producing in one another and be a church that gives thanks to God for those things. Paul is in prison. He's in chains and he's hearing a report and his heart is captivated for these things. How much more as we're joined together in love should we be concerned with these things for one another and go to the only one who has the power to produce these things in ourselves, which is God? Lastly, we just need to be impressed by what God does in the gospel. Paul gives thanks after thanks after thanks for the things that God, these manifestations of the gospel that God is producing in the lives of these Colossians. We just have to be in awe at what God does in the gospel. It truly is astonishing. The gift of faith, love, hope, fruit, impact on those around us, all because of his grace, all because of his goodness, all because of his love. And all of those things are worthy of giving thanks. And they're all rooted and grounded in what Jesus Christ has done in his giving of his own life in the gospel for all who would repent and believe. Can't even begin to understand the infinite wisdom of God, the captivating love of God in the gospel that would offer such a gift to those who don't deserve it. Let's pray. God, we do thank you so much for your love We thank you for sending your son as the perfect, only acceptable sacrifice to redeem and rescue sinners such as us. And Lord, we want to echo Paul's sentiments of thanks for the Colossians as we give thanks for your work in our lives and the lives of those around us. Give us a burden for your gospel to go forth. And as lots of things are 
vying for our attention. I pray that what would be on the forefront of our hearts and minds, even in the midst of our own troubles, as Paul is praying this from prison, would be the furtherance of the gospel for the sake of souls being saved and you being glorified. We long for those things. Help us to long more. We pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.